Hi everyone, it's Sean. Wanted to hop on before the start of the show to say that we recorded this prior to the murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis and the subsequent protesting taking place across the United States and around the world. And I don't have too much to add to what has been said about the situation. And I recognize that words at this time can be very hollow and it's not my place. And I would not and and could not tell people how to feel or how to react in situations like this. I do, though, want to comment on some of the things that I've seen in the press and on social media from people who are fortunate enough and privileged enough to not be subjected to racism and violence on a daily basis. This is a time to listen and to learn. There are a ton of resources available if you want to learn more, if you want to hear from people who are subjected to racism on a daily basis listen to their stories learn from those experiences and do your best to work with people to dismantle the societal structures that perpetuate and allow racism and racial violence to continue go to websites like the NAACP. It's NAACP.org. They have a ton of internal resources and links to external resources that will give the history of racism in America, the racial biases and structures and how all of these political, economic, and social structures were created and perpetuate that allow the type of thing that we saw in Minneapolis uh, to continue to happen. At the same time, I would encourage you, if you have not yet, this is a time to go read the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's final report, to look through the calls to actions, figure out how you in your own life can start to put those things into place. Same thing with the report on murdered and missing indigenous women. This is a time to read that to learn and to work towards eliminating these structural issues that are at play. Human beings have a remarkable power to recognize when there are barriers in our way. You know, when the wind is in your face, you can tell. But when the wind is at your back and it's aiding you, we have this ability to not recognize that. So for those of us who are fortunate enough and privileged enough to live and work in places where we are not racialized, where we are not subjected to racism and violence simply because of the color of our skin, this is our time to learn, to listen, and to be allies. So with that being said, Here is today's episode of The History Slam. Welcome to The History Slam podcast from ActiveHistory.ca. Here's your host, Sean Graham. Thank you, Adam. Welcome to The History Slam, everybody. I am Sean Graham coming at you today nearly live from Ottawa, Ontario. It is June 4th, which is Tom Longboat Day. For anyone who doesn't know, Tom Longboat was a distance runner in the early part of the 20th century, athletically probably most famous for winning the Boston Marathon in 1907. He also won the World Professional Marathon Championship in 1909. Uh, Just a a wonderful athlete, great runner, well known for, for winning races both in Canada and around the world. But... Tom Longboat and his life, his career, he also confronted great prejudice and racism. He was a member of the Six Nations Grand River Reserve near Brantford, Ontario. And one example of the prejudice that he faced during his life and his career was that he figured out that 
you didn't have to train as hard as you could every day. At the time, a lot of runners would go hard every day, you know, run marathon length training sessions and just go as hard as they could. And what Tom Longboat figured out is that if he were to rest a little more and, and include rest as part of his training regime, when he went to run the races, he was fresher and in an actual better condition than a lot of the other runners. So as he implemented this into his training, his times got better and better and it gave him a competitive advantage. But as he was doing this, he was labeled as lazy. And newspaper writers at the time and some of his competitors would label him or call him a quote unquote lazy Indian, which of course is not only racist, but it's so unfounded because the technique that he had come up with was working and was better than what they were doing. And it's an example of the way in which indigenous athletes are treated and the prejudice and racism that they face as they compete. Uh, after his career as a runner, Tom Longboat enlisted in the Canadian military in 1916, saw action overseas, was injured a couple of times during the war, and returned in 1919. Following his death in the 1940s, the Tom Longboat Awards were unveiled uh, in 1951 and they are awards that are presented annually to the top indigenous athletes in Canada and these awards are now the subject of a new book entitled Reclaiming Tom Longboat Indigenous Self-Determination in Canadian Sport by Janice Forsyth who is in the Department of Sociology at Western University and the director of the school's First Nations Studies. The book looks at the way in which sport and the awards are part of a larger process of colonization in Canada and really examines the way in which sport and the state are working in conjunction to police indigenous bodies, identities, and cultures, and how these are all just part of the wider colonizing process in Canada while at the same time addressing and acknowledging the potential of sport to become a tool for decolonization and self-determination. It's really a wonderful book, very thought-provoking, and I had the opportunity to talk to Janice Forsyth last week. So, without any further ado, here's my conversation with Janice Forsyth. All right, and we welcome in Janice Forsyth, joining us from London, Ontario this afternoon. Janice, how are you today? I'm doing all right. It's a Friday afternoon, so it's uh, it's a good day. Yeah, it uh, it really is. Is uh, the heat starts to break here, at least in eastern Ontario, which is uh, I, I'm excited about a uh, mm -hmm. bit of a heat wave over the past few days. And uh, one of the things that I've been interested in in talking to you about is this whole story of Tom Longboat. As I, as I talked about in the intro, his personal story is one that I'm I'm somewhat familiar with, not you know super intimately familiar with, but it's a story I'm. I'm familiar with I, what I didn't know though, until I, I really read into it in more depth was actually that these awards were put in place, you know, as, as part almost of a, of a, his legacy. So just for anyone who doesn't know and isn't familiar with the awards themselves, what do they do and how are they determined each year? Right. So the, the awards have been around uh, since 1951. Uh, they were established by the Department of what was then the Department of Indian Affairs and the Amateur Athletic Union of Canada. And uh, they were to ostensibly celebrate the accomplishments of uh, Tom Longboat. They're awarded, um, they have been awarded every year, or almost every year actually, since 1951. And uh, they go to um, athletes who compete in what I call the mainstream sport system. Uh, what was then the amateur sport system, and basically any athlete who achieves, um, you know, some level of recognition within that system. And so, typically, the, these are the athletes who have reached some level of elite level competition, whether it's competing at the national level, the international level, or the Olympic Games. So, it um, they usually go to uh, the most accomplished Indigenous athletes. Uh, and in the 1990s, um, they, the 
the organization that was then responsible for the awards, the Aboriginal Sports Circle, they created a, a female category. And prior to that, it was just, um, you know, one category and it could be a male or a female athlete who would win the award. So they've been around for a long time and given out almost annually since then, which means there have been um, hundreds of Indigenous athletes who have been recognized through the decades. And we should say, of course, that you are one of those athletes. Uh, mm -hmm. we, we talked before you won in 2002. You were uh, a runner. Uh, I assume you still run a little bit. <laughs> I'm uh, sure. Yeah, I like to uh, I like to run and uh, I run mostly for mental health and to fit into my pants. <laughs> so a very different kind of runner. I just uh, definitely not a competitive runner. I, I shy away from anything remotely similar to competition. So you can find me out in the trails in London, Ontario, running by myself with my headphones on. And that's about as good as it gets these days. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but but I, I'm curious to, to know, as, as you know, as a someone who has received the award, uh, I'm curious as to, you know, before you, you got into this in a in this sort of academic way, when you received it back in 2002, what did it mean to you at the time? And what was your reaction to winning the award? Yeah, funny enough, that was actually one of the inspirations for, um, you know, part of my thinking about the Tom Longfoot Awards. I, I had known about the awards when I was in high school. My mom uh, was working at the um, Ministry of Natural Resources, and she had this... Uh, um, uh, what was then like a fax printout or, or what would have been like a similar to a facsimile. And it was about um, the Tom Longboat Awards. And, you know, at the time I thought, wow, you know, if I'm ever good enough, I'll try and compete for one of those awards. And um, the years went by and uh, I, I never did um, qualify for one of the awards, at least not in my head. And so when I won the award in 2002, um, it really kind of shocked me because I think that uh, part of me felt like I hadn't really deserved the award. I mean, I'm not an Olympian. I won the award for competing at the North American Indigenous Games and uh, for my accomplishments at uh, Western University, my alma mater, where I was on the track and field and um, cross-country running teams. But, um, you know, another part of me also thought just about how proud I was because, you know, this was me being recognized by you know, other Indigenous people for my accomplishments in sport. And so it really got me thinking about, um, you know, who gets recognized for the awards and, you know, how it makes people feel connected to their, you know, Indigenous identity and, you know, to the larger Indigenous community in Canada. So in a way, it started this emotional journey, this uh, almost psychological journey into what sport meant to me and what it means to other Indigenous people. So let's get into that a little bit, because one of the things that this book delves into and discusses and discusses in great detail, as the the subtitle suggests, is self determination within sport and really the the relationship between indigenous athletes and the state. And one of the things you said earlier uh, was talking about mainstream sports or, or amateur sports, and it's interesting that, you know, certainly in, in sort of the, the summary of the book that was sent to me, it says that uh, the, the book is looking at um, the assimilationist sporting regulations of residential schools to the present day exclusion of indigenous activities from mainstream sports. And that the terminology of, of mainstream sports is quite interesting to me because, you know, what is mainstream in certain parts of the country versus other parts of the country to an international audience. Uh, you know, it just, it, it depends on where you are. So I'm curious as to how you define first off mainstream when you're mm -hmm. talking about the sporting landscape. You know, that's a great question. It's one of the things that I really struggled with in trying to um, define the parameters for the book. And uh, you know, it's one of the things that's difficult to explain to larger audiences. So, you know, Part of the thinking around what kind of sport are we talking about here is to go to the definition that Sport Canada uses and that um, is often used in sport sociology. So it's it's basically anything that, um, you know, is rule bound. So it has well defined rule books. I mean, anybody who does sport or who coaches sport or administrates sport, you know, knows that their sport is, um, you know, bounded by very complex rules you know the the IAAF manuals for instance for track and field is hundreds of pages long um 
It also leads to higher levels of competitive development. Um, so that makes it, you know, very different than, you know, what um, I'm doing when I put on my headphones and I go run out on the trails. And there's also usually um, sporting organizations that um, police or organizations that police um, the the development of the organization or the or the sport. So it, it's an institution, you know, in and of itself. And so when I'm talking about mainstream sports, I'm really talking about these kind of rule bound competitive sports that, um, you know, are formally organized, that are well defined, that people understand so that um, even someone like myself, you know, I understand the difference between what I do when I, you know, 20 years previously when I was running on the track to what I'm doing now. They're two very different things, even though I might go out and buy the same running shoes and I might go out and buy the same fancy sort of running clothes. Um, I am not doing the same thing as I did when I won the Tom Longboat Award in 2002. So that's what I mean when I'm talking about mainstream sports. And I'm curious to know what your thoughts are too. How much of this is associated with the Olympics and surrounded by the Olympics and I, you know, we'll certainly talk about the state and sort of the, the national lens of this, but there's also an international side of it, that, at least the way I would envision it, because so much of a sport's legitimacy comes from the Olympic Games. And, you know, I, I really like curling. I, I curl uh, recreationally. I, I like to follow it. And that's a sport that has fundamentally changed in the now 22 years since it's been in the Olympics and there's a greater recognition of its athletic requirements because of that and other sports that have been included and, and then not included, that seems to have a great impact on how the sport is viewed both nationally and internationally. And, and I'm just curious to know if the Olympics is really central to this idea of mainstream and then how that international lens then will we'll get into how that influences a national understanding of the sport. Mm -hmm, For sure. And that's a really good point. Um, You know, at at the Olympic games, uh, you know, the first Olympic games were in the late 1800s and 1896. And, uh, you know, ever since then, not ever since then, but uh, shortly after in the early 1900s, you know, the Olympic games um, gained legitimacy worldwide as, you know, one of the, the dominant sporting institutions. And so when governments around the world are deciding, you know, which sports to fund, they often look to the Olympic games to make their decisions because, you know, they want to be able to put people on the podium um, at the Olympic games for all sorts of reasons. A lot of it having to do with, you know, nationalism and building, you know, relationships with the corporations that fund the Olympic Games. Um, you know, one can make an argument that the Olympic Games are to some extent losing their legitimacy and other organizations are, you know, beginning to usurp some of the power that the IOC has in terms of um, determining which sports are legitimate. But I think um, it's still fair to say that the IOC is still, you know, the dominant player. So when you're making that um You know, that kind of comment that uh, mainstream sports are very much tied to what is happening at the Olympic Games, that is a true statement, and and that is very true in Canada. Which is too bad, because the IOC are, in general, not the greatest of people, from (laughs) everything I've read, uh, about the individuals who populate that organization. Yeah, and right, and even just in terms of how um, you know what it is that the the IOC prioritizes and values, it's uh, it's rife with all sorts of problems. And you can go online and, and Google the Olympic Games and controversies and conflicts, and there's tons of stuff that comes up. There's a really robust literature around the history of the Olympic Games that picks apart um, these issues and. You know, I was, uh, you know, part of that conversation not too long ago when I was the director of the International Center for Olympic Studies here at Western. So it's, a, you know, a conversation that I'm quite familiar with. And, and I can see why your question is a good question about how the mainstream sports, you know, in Canada is linked to what is happening at the Olympic Games and why why that's so full of problems. Right. And so if, if we turn it back to that national lens, that mm-hmm. a lot of what sport Canada and, and certainly, you know, things like own the podium, it's, it's all about results and having athletes who have a chance of winning Olympic medals. And it really seems to be centered on this and, and, you know, to extrapolate that out, this seems like a, a way to 
legitimize the state that if these athletes are competing for Canada and if they are getting medals for Canada and, and certainly, you know, I remember the 2010 Olympics, whenever a Canadian athlete won and they played that, I believe song with the slow motion montage. Like I was so by the end of, I think I tweeted at the end of the 2010 Olympics, something like, can I stop believing now? Like I, like that song was just so, uh, it's so part of the broadcast. I found it really annoying, but it feels to me that this is part of this larger legitimate legitimizing of the state that by competing under the flag and by putting in all this, you know, nationalist rhetoric that goes into an Olympic Games and just sport in general when you're competing uh, internationally as the representative of the country, that that's part of the state and legitimizing the state. And in Canada, therefore, part of the colonial process. So one, am I going too far with that? And if I'm not, how do Indigenous athletes fit into this model well you know and that's um a really good way to tease it some of the nuances of um you know what's in the book and so when the tom logboat awards were established in 1951 the idea wasn't to so much to to get the um the recipients uh you know representing canada at the international level it wasn't to put them on the podium so to speak it was really about to assimilate them into Canadian culture, and that is what makes the awards really unique in terms of Canadian history and where they certain they sit in terms of Canadian sport. Um, it wasn't the only uh, major sport award out at the time. There were several other that um, you know were given to uh, top level athletes in Canada, and typically those athletes though were the ones who were representing Canada, you know, at major international events uh, like the Olympic Games. But the Tom Longboat Awards were different. You know, when they, they first came out, they were, you know, broadcast and promoted um, heavily through the Indian residential school system, at least for the first 20 years. And so you see a lot of the recipients in the 1950s and the 1960s coming through the residential school system. And uh, the messages typically that you see uh, being promoted in that era, whether it's from the Indian agents, the principals, or... Um, you know, maybe the coaches who were nominating uh, these athletes, you know, it was typically about how well these kids were, you know, fitting into mainstream, how they were good uh, role models for um, for the other kids, uh, the other Indigenous uh, kids around them, um, you know, how they would make good Canadian citizens. So that's typically the discourse that you would see. Things shifted um, in the 1970s and the 1980s, and at that point, the awards uh, were no longer with the Department of Indian Affairs and the Amateur Athletic Union of Canada. They were then with the uh, the National Indian Bro Brotherhood, which became the Assembly of First Nations. Um, and there was also a shift uh, much more broadly um, within the Canadian government, moving more towards high performance sport. And this is when you start to see the emergence of the real, you know, high performance elite Indigenous athletes coming forward. Um, and so this is when you start to see um, athletes who are competing, you know, in the Commonwealth Games or the Olympic Games. Um, and then it progresses more so through the ages where now, um, you know, in order to be a national recipient, you are probably either on a world team, if not a world champion, or you've competed at Olympic Games or you've been an alternate it, I mean, it's just, um, it really is the best of the best, uh, whether you're Indigenous or not. So we, we see the progression through the years in terms of who is being uh, targeted for the awards. It's almost like that mirrors sort of the larger, or the wider focus of sporting awards in general. Like if you look at sort of who has been inducted in the Canada, Canada Sports Hall of Fame for instance, right there, I know the, the 2020 class was announced recently, and there really is a focus on the professionalization of sports, even amateur sports, it's people who are doing it full time. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, you look back before the, the Second World War, and it was more or, or less of full time athletes and people who compete along with other things. And it, so it feels like this is mirroring a larger trend that happened in Canada through the second half of the 20th century, this focus on professionalization, which does speak to this process of 
trying to bring in indigenous peoples into this wider state run system of, of sport in Canada. For sure. And, and I think the, um, the Tom Longboat awards and the people who um, have won the award, the, that pattern is a really good expression of that. Um, you know, with the other sport awards uh, that were created, uh, and I can't remember exactly what they were. I'd have to go back and check, but they were about uh, maybe 15 to 20 years earlier than the Tom Longboat Awards. You know, they were still nominating athletes who were competing, you know, in the Olympic Games. So, the, um, you know, sport had started to become more professionalized, you know, from the late 1800s, the early 1900s onwards. But we really see um, the kind of the full expression of that beginning in the 1970s and, and definitely in the 1980s uh, when the government um, really moved uh, all of its resources towards high performance sport. And so for sure, you know, the Tom Longboat Awards are an expression of that. I'm curious to note too this idea of role models and mm -hmm. using the people who win the awards as, as role models, as, as holding them up as, as something. We, we've, there's so many examples of this other places in the world. A good example that I, I use in my classes when I teach about the Second World War is a Joe Lewis, the boxer, who was used by the American military as an example of an African-American who is sort of, quote unquote, doing the right thing and doing his part. And therefore, he was an accept, he was acceptable, right? And, and sort of, you know, it, it this really, this, this thing that kind of almost makes your skin crawl as you read it back, some of the things that people were saying about him. But for the awards, it feels like, you know, the more I've read about it and the more I've learned about it, that this is a similar idea, that the the way that these people are being used as role models is almost a way to say that you too can be accepted by the state. And, mm -hmm. you know, as, as a further way to almost delegitimize, delegitimize you know, traditional practice, culture, language, all of these things that are just being stripped away or attempted to be stripped away by the state anyway. And it's it, it almost feels to me that the award itself, while is recognizing athletic achievement, sort of the duality of that purpose, to a certain extent, I, like, I don't know, does it, does it reduce sort of the, the, significance of the award or does it does it take anything away from the achievement of the individuals who who won it because it has that motivation behind it i think i think for me the the tom longboat awards are um you know a really good entry point uh for having these conversations and that's you know one of the um one of the main takeaway points that i was hoping people would uh, come away with, you know, from reading the book. And, you know, I pointed out in the conclusion um, and I build on it a little bit, but you never know what people take away from it. I think um, for me, when I was talking to the recipients and uh, there are a number of other recipients who I interviewed, I've, I've interviewed about 50 uh, throughout Canada, but there's only a few who are part of this book. Um, but generally, you know, people are quite ambivalent about um, being named a role model uh, simply for winning a Tom Longboat Award. And um, and I think part of that comes from not really knowing, you know, the history of the award and also not being able to, um, you know, explain how they feel about winning the award and, and what it means to them. So in other words, not being able to tell their story and so, you know, when you sit down with the recipients and, and you give them time to, to talk about their story and, um, you know, and explain in a much fuller way about, about what the awards mean to them, you get this real richness about, um, you know, what it means to be Indigenous, um, you know, what it means to be Indigenous in sport, uh, about um, the challenges that they faced, uh, not only in sport, but in life as well as, you know, the agency, the ways in which they've expressed themselves through sport. And it's really interesting because, you know, everybody talks about uh, their culture um, in one way or another, about where they come from, you know, whether it's rooted in a, in a particular uh, community and having grown up there or maybe, you know, having grown away, uh, grown up away from their community and, and what it means to, 
you know, try and find their way back, um, if, if I can express it that way, and which is, you know, sort of my story, because I, I didn't grow up in Fisher River, which is, you know, the community where my family comes from, and, and so it really meant a lot for me to win the Tom Longboat Award, but it also created this real sort of schism, you know, in my mind about, wow, you know, what does it mean for me to be Indigenous? So I, I think what you what you get then is this real ambivalence, which means it's a great talking point, a great, you know, story to, um, you know, help people unfold about what sport means to them, about what the Tom Longboat Awards means to them, about what messages then are we hearing about with the Tom Longboat Awards? Because if you're to take a look in the media, if you're to Google, um, you know, any of the, the stories that media promote about these Tom Longboat recipients, and, and I know because I've, I've looked at some of them, most of them are quite bland, right? They're your typical media narrative. It's just uh, so-and-so on this award, you know, they accomplished this in sport, and uh, there might be some sort of reference to their cultural background, but it's a very traditional sporting narrative. And so in a way, this is where it links back to Tom Longboat. It's like we really know nothing about Tom Longboat because he was never given a chance to speak, right? right. Um, like there, there, there is no... Um, autobiography he didn't leave journals behind he didn't leave um he didn't write massive letters that you know were um you know available to to people to go and write stories about so we never really know what tom longboat thought about his fame about how he felt about all of the um the, the trials and tribulations that he must have went through and it's the same you know for the the recipients uh, from 1951 onwards, we we know so little about them. We make all sorts of assumptions about what their experiences are like, about you know about them being role models, about how you know um, you know maybe what their sporting experiences were like, and yet we know nothing about them. So I think um, again, you know, for me, the Tom Longboat Award is really a great talking point for cracking open these stories that can tell us a great deal, not just about what it means to be Indigenous in sport, but also what it means to be Indigenous in Canada. And uh, sport is just a great way to do that. Yeah, and the Tom Longboat example is really fascinating to me, too, because of just, as you say, you, there's not much known or, or not a lot of records about what his personality was. You know, we know that he served in the First World War. We know that he was a runner. We know that he was heavily criticized when he took rest days, mm -hmm. um, right, and was called lazy because of that. And then he just went and beat everybody because he was rested as when everyone else was just running it. Like he was, you know, he, he had these training techniques that were smarter than everybody else, which put him at a competitive advantage because he figured it out before anybody else did. And yet he was heavily criticized for it. And I, I wonder too, if that's part of the reason why there isn't that much, because if that's the way he was treated by the media, if that's the way he was treated by his fellow competitors, why would he want to engage in in that and you know it, you know do interviews leave some sort of a record through which we could figure out who he is and as you say that strikes me as really being sort of an example of the relationship between state sort of state sanctioned canada and canadian institutions and indigenous peoples and specifically with indigenous athletes i think for me part of the challenge is that media people who are writing these stories don't know what to do with the complexity of um, the stories that Indigenous athletes um, really want to tell if they're given the space to tell it. So what ends up happening then is the, uh, the reporters uh, filter, of course, the, um, the accounts that have been provided to them. And at the end of the day, I mean, they're always the final author, the, the journalists, right? They get to write what they want to write. And uh, so they end up writing palatable stories that their audiences will understand and, um, you know, and maybe be attracted to. So I think um, I think journalists need to learn um, how to deal with the, the complexities. And, and I think it's I hope I think it's getting better, especially in alternative media with the um, not so much like the big corporate media. But um, I, I think it's getting better in some respects on the margins. But uh, I think journalists in general need to learn how to deal with this complexity more, especially if they want to create more interesting stories um, and stories that help to advance Indigenous interests for sport. Because to get back to, you know, a point that or a comment that you made earlier about um, whether the Tom Longboat Awards, uh, you know, 
are part of the, the process of marginalizing, you know, traditional cultural practices and views. And absolutely, they are. Um, it's one of the um, the one of the challenges, if you will, of of the Tom Longboat Awards. I mean, there has been no recipient who since 1951 who has won the Tom Longboat Award because of their involvement in traditional Indigenous games. Um, lacrosse might be the exception, but that uh, the, the people who have won lacrosse uh, or the award for lacrosse are competing in mainstream events, right? Right. So you don't see people, for instance, um, uh, from the Arctic Winter Games, uh, you don't see people who, um, you know, are participating in maybe more localized uh, sports that are important to Indigenous people. They're winning it for sports that have been determined to be important and worth funding by the government and these uh, and the sport organizations that um, are there to carry out uh, sport. So it's um, it's that broader complexity, you know, of, of the story that people want to tell. Because when you again, when you talk to the recipients, they do talk about culture, they do talk about their identity, and they they talk about you know how important it was for them to win the award, but they're also very ambivalent about what it means in their lives. Because if you think about it this way, like you win the award, um, you know, and it's it's a real honor, but at the same time, this word is also responsible for, you know, marginalizing other forms of Indigenous values and practices. And so it's um, it's a real tough place to be, I think, for the athletes, because it's like there are no other visible expressions or celebrations of um, Indigenous sport at this level. There is only the Tom Longboat Award. Maybe if there is like a, a broader um, category of awards, um, then it might be different. But uh, but I think that's why the stories of these athletes are uh, so important to tell. And that's why I think journalists need to do a better job of understanding what it is that they're reporting on when they're talking to athletes. Well, I guess the question that, that I would have to that is what stories are journalists, are sports journalists in particular, telling just in general, you know, with professional athletes, whatever sport it is there there's almost like this push sometimes of like just the sort of that stick to sports narrative you know just sort of in, in contemporary times with what's going on in the united states right now a lot of nba players are are speaking out about what's going on and some of the pushback is you know stick to sports and that speak that goes to some journalists too where you know uh, you know over the past couple of months there hasn't been games to write about but there's this sense that journalists of sports they're just right about what happens on the field uh and in the games and that's it don't get into the broader spectrum mm -hmm. of what this all means of or even of who these people are so is that something that you've noticed as well within sports journalism that there's this hyper focus on the performance and the competition and a little less on the humanity in general, or is that specific, do you think, to these particular athletes? Absolutely. I think, um, I mean, I think this would be a great project, first of all, for a, for a PhD or a researcher is to do some sort of uh, media analysis of um, how Indigenous uh, athletes are represented uh, in Canadian media. But just, you know, from what I've seen, uh, yeah, journalists tend to stick to um, fairly traditional themes. And with Indigenous athletes, you know, it's often racism, whether you're male or female, you know, as if that's kind of the most salient issue um, out there. Or it's um, and a variant of that, of course, is the development discourse where, you know, it's about how good sport was for someone because it got them out of their community or it helped them, you know, get into school, which may be true. Um, but it's also a fairly common uh, narrative, I think, that, it, again, it's one of those narratives that's palatable to, um, you know, a, a mainstream audience, uh, because those are the kind of discourses, I think, that they would feel very comfortable, you know, understanding. They're not so comfortable, you know, wanting to hear about how sport, um, you know, might not have been um you know, all that beneficial. And yet, you know, the athlete persevered and they're making, you know, 
finding a new way through sport and coming to a new understanding of what it means. Um, there are very few people who are reporting on, you know, that kind of sport as an important cultural practice. I mean, what a, you know, for me, it would just be um, a real thrill to see more reporting of sport by non-sport journalists, yeah. um, where we're talking about sport as an important cultural practice in much the same way that we talk about, um, you know, education now as a complex uh, socialization um, practice or health, you know, more broadly, um, or the environment, like sport is a part of everyday life. And, um, you know, sure, it it has its own um, space in a lot of media, but it just, when it's in that particular sporting space, there are narratives that journalists often rely on in order for the readers who read that, those articles, you know, for them to be constantly drawn in and, and understand, you know, what is actually happening. So, um, so for sure, you know, I, I think the pattern that you've pointed out is what I would say um, is true as well. But it would be so great um, just to see some formal research um, done on this where someone does some systematic analysis of, of the media in terms of how they're reporting on Indigenous athletes so we could point, you know, journalists to the, the evidence and go, look, here it is, because right now all I've got is anecdotal evidence, me talking about what I see in the, in the newspapers and the, in the media, just the same as you. Right. And that's one of the thing, right? It's sort of these tendencies that we we notice, but we're not sure for like 100 yeah. percent if they do exist. And, and you're absolutely right. It'd be a great study for somebody to go in and, and do that. Uh, one of the things, too, that I'm curious about that you mentioned, you talked about that the awards are, are given to people who participate in these mainstream sports. And you mentioned traditional games, uh, traditional sports that these awards can help marginalize these. And, and I'm curious to know, you know what types of, of traditional sports games are there and with something like track and field, say, right? You, it's it's kind of easy to assess who is the best at this, right? Who's good at it? Because you take a time, a stopwatch, and you figure out who goes mm -hmm. the fastest. Uh, you know, other sports, it's hard to determine who is the best and it's a lot more subjective and, I, and i'm curious to know if 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 the awards were extended to some of these traditional games are there mechanisms in place to determine who's the best at it quote unquote and even if there are is that a productive process to bring mm -hmm. in something that is associated with again these mainstream sports into the traditional games that are being played it, you know what? I really struggled with this years ago. So, um, and again, part of the inspiration for the book was uh, when when I worked at the Aboriginal Sports Circle because I worked at the Aboriginal Sports Circle and, and they're the custodians of the awards, and they have been since um, you know the late 1990s. So I started working there in uh, 2000, and one of the areas, the program areas that I was responsible for, was the Tom Longboat Awards, and. Um, uh, one of my tasks was to come up with kind of a scoring grid in order for people to make a more objective determination. And at that time, you know, none of the research had been done around the Tom Longboat Awards. So I, you know, so we are basically starting from scratch. So I developed this scoring grid um, with the help of a, a committee, but, uh, but I was at the helm and, and, you know, I put the scoring grid in the book as sort of a, um, a, a reflection of um, my own thinking about the awards. And what was really interesting is that um, we ended up reproducing, you know, some of the things that we were struggling against, you know, with the Aboriginal Sports Circle in terms of trying to create more access and equity um, for Indigenous athletes. And, and by that, I mean the, the scoring grid really privileged um, these elite uh, mainstream sporting events and sporting accomplishments. And so you can imagine, for instance, um, uh, the award was divided into kind of a, there was an athletic component and then there was a, the, a cultural component. The athletic component was really, you know, the Olympic Games at the top and then there are the Pan Am Games, and the Commonwealth Games and, and so on. And our own events like the, the North American Indigenous Games were much lower down on the scoring grid. So um, 
So if you were, you know, uh, an athlete like myself at the North American Indigenous Games, and that was the highest level of competition that you'd ever reached, um, you know, it would be extremely difficult for you to uh, win the national award if there was an athlete who, you know, went on to the Commonwealth Games or the Olympic Games. And it, it took me a while to unpack it. And what I ended up um thinking about later on was the problem of, you know, the performance principle. And this is the idea that, um, you know, we value this sort of um, objective, what we think is an objective measurement in order to assess who was best. And, um, and it's this idea that like, yeah, every improvement can be improved upon. So we have this performance principle that we're advocating, um, you know, with the Tom Longboat Awards and uh, somehow this is supposed to be an objective way to to assess um, performance, and uh, and then it, it then I got shaken out out of that kind of mindset uh, when I started learning more about um, the Indigenous Games up north in, in in the Arctic Winter Games, and how it wasn't so much based on the performance principle up there, but they really. Um, had their sports rooted in traditional cultural values. And so, for instance, um, there's exa this example that um, that was given to me. It was like um, you could have like these extraordinary athletes because they're extraordinary athletes. If, if you've ever seen the athletes in the Arctic Winter Games, like it's just um, the things they can do with their, their bodies and, and their performance is just they're so strong and they're so agile. It's utterly amazing, but you'll never, you know, those sports aren't part of the Olympic Games. But, um, you know, for them, their their sports are, are supposed to be more connected to the land. And so um, it was the elders who got to decide, you know, who is worth um, emulating and who is worth um, celebrating, you know, through their traditional games. And so that really kind of shocked me out of my mindset in terms of, wow, you know, here we are. We have this like rubric now for the for the Tom Longboat Awards. But um, but it really doesn't um, work well if you think about it from, you know, traditional northern perspectives. And so like we we hardly have like any athletes from the far north who are in traditional games, for instance, who have won a Tom Longboat Award, not only because they're sports, are not part of like the mainstream system in the sense that you can't go to the Olympic Games for the um, for the one foot high kick um, or for like the kneel hop, um, but also just their values like are completely different, right? Yeah. And and so um, and so while mainstream Canada understands the Tom Longboat Awards, like anybody who's reading the book and if they take a look at the scoring grids that are in the book, and oddly enough, the scoring grid that I created was almost like the same scoring grid that um, a group, uh, someone from the National Indian Brotherhood um, had created back in like the 1980s. Um, so the thinking, right, hadn't changed that much from the 1980s to the early 2000s. Like I was reproducing the same sort of thinking. So you can see how that knowledge, you know, and, you know, that that practice was stable over time. But um, anybody who's reading the book and they take a look at those scoring grids and they're in mainstream sport, they'll go, oh, that makes sense. Yeah, that, that totally makes sense, because, of course, you want to privilege like those kinds of performances. But if you're looking at it, you know, from a traditional like indigenous perspectives, you'll say, oh, that's all wrong. Right. right. And, and so this is where like the Tom Longboat Awards, um, you know, marginalize traditional, um, you know, more indigenous rooted values and practices. And, you know, if we're going to. Um, you know, decolonize the awards or if we're going to really make the awards um, more rooted in indigenous customs, if, if that is the aspirations of the Tom Longboat Awards, that's not for me to say, um, then you've really got to rethink, you know, the the valuing of the those objective measurements, as you say, um, or the performance principle and um, valorizing those as being what is worth most, you know, with the Tom Longboat Awards. I guess the question I would have off of that is the matter of scale to of, of the competition that this comes up to the Lou Marsh award every year when people put amateur Olympic athletes against professional athletes. And this question of scale, you know, if you're going to pick a bobsledder for the award versus a soccer player, you know, 
the the number to rise to the top in that sport there's different numbers of people against whom you are competing and i wonder if that's an argument that's made here too you know or, or even regionality of it you know if there's a sport that is specific to the north and specific to on the prairies mm -hmm. or, or wherever that these are regional as opposed to having national competition so how do you give a national award if it's regional uh, participation and and the scale of participation you know how do you assess being the best and and sort of the the wide swath of the competition like all those questions seem to me to be somewhat legitimate when you're trying to give an award based off of athletic uh, athletic achievement but at the same time as you mentioned it doesn't really take into account those traditional values mm. that the sport truly represents so you know is there any way to account for for questions of scale and questions of regionality within a national structure mm -hmm. like this yeah there's um so i guess it's important for me to say that the there are also regional eleven uh regional level awards like there always have been uh, since 1951. And so, for instance, when I won the Tom Longboat Award, it was for the province of Ontario. It was for Ontario. It wasn't the, the national award. Right. Um, but certainly, you know, all through the years and, uh, you know, ever since, you know, I've uh, been associated with the Aboriginal Sports Circle there. there have, And even just, you know, when I was looking through the historical documents and there, there's these tensions that run through the book as well about, you um, uh, about scale, as you say, and I think that's part of the problem with, you know, the Tom Longboat Awards trying to be everything to everybody and and they simply can't be right. So the, there is no way for the awards, as far as I can tell, um, to both celebrate the accomplishments of these elite level athletes, indigenous athletes. And at the same time, be rooted in, you know, um, indigenous uh, values and practices. I think there is a fundamental divide here. And, though you know, that is probably one that is the main tension. I think that runs through the, the award. The award was never set up right to um, privilege and to advance these indigenous values and practices. It was set up you know, to assimilate um, Indigenous athletes, Indigenous children into the mainstream system. And so what we have now is an award um, that celebrates Indigenous compliment, uh, accomplishments in mainstream sport at the end, you know, all of the values and practices associated with that. And um, I don't think there is a space um, in that, in, in the way that the awards are currently structured to... Um, also advance and prioritize indigenous rooted values, you know, and customs and practices. I think there is a fundamental divide there. And that is, you know, one of the tensions that have always been running through the awards. Um, you know, I've just, it was obvious in the historical documents, especially when, you know, the National Indian Brotherhood got a hold of the award, um, especially when, you know, sometimes when people were writing in and, um, you know, and their nominations were really beautiful. And uh, they, you know, they were trying to make a case, um, you know, for how the awards were advancing Indigenous values and practices. But at the end of the day, um, it really, you know, prioritizes mainstream sport and, you know, all of the, the discourses and, and, and practices that go around it. So I just I don't think there is a way to um bridge that divide but but maybe that's my own limitation in in the thinking like about the awards and maybe that's for future administrators and future um researchers in the area of sport to to figure out yeah i i agree that yeah there's no certainly no easy answer to to the way in which reckon we reconcile all these things and to a certain extent it all to me almost boils down to the question of what is the point or what is the purpose of sport and why do we participate? Why do we follow it? Why do we want to engage with these types of things? And, you know, I mean, I grew up playing sports. I, I still like sports. And, you know, I, I personally, I feel as though, you know, I learned things like being a good teammate and discipline and, you know, mm -hmm. overcoming failure, all, all those things that, you know, I learned or I feel as though I learned uh, participating in sports as a kid. And yet, you look at this award and, you know, as we talked about the idea of role models and, and getting people within these state sponsored systems, uh, 
it seems like sport within indigenous communities can have the same purpose of building culture and, and sort of teaching things to young people. But within the structure of the way it works, certainly where I grew up, it would should be very different from what I experienced because what is being conveyed or what is, the, the culture that exists around sport would be different based on the communities where mm -hmm. these kids are engaging. And yet something like the Longboat Awards doesn't seem to recognize that. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, um, you know, competitive sport um, just in and of itself is exclusionary. Uh, it's just mm. that there's just no way for it to be um, truly inclusive because, you know, only a certain number of athletes can play on a team. Only a certain number of people can move forward. Um, and, you know, and those are the ones who typically can afford, you know, to do that. Yeah. So I think, um, you know, it, it, mainstream sport is exclusionary, but, if we look at, um, you know, the history of indigenous sport, um, you know, it, it, what uh, physical practices mean to indigenous people, yeah, it's very different, you know, than what we see in mainstream sport. And again, this is why I think there is such a huge divide between, you know, what indigenous people are advocating for when they're talking about sport, especially if it's tied to culture and identity and what um, sport looks like in the mainstream system. So, you know, indigenous sport has always been like land based. It's always been rooted and tied to a connection to the land. Um, you know, and this was the case in, in the 1800s uh, and, of course, long before that. And uh, when the May, you know, when um, organized sports uh, started to become developed um, in the 1800s, because, of course, it's a relatively new invention. Uh, it was divorced, you know, mainstream sport is divorced from any ties to land. Uh, you know, it's, um, there were no real spiritual elements to it. It's, uh, it's it, in a confined space. Um, you know, there's, uh, no kind of real, um, practical kind of political, um, implications that flow from, you know, playing in a game. Uh, whereas with indigenous sports, there was, you know, it was very much a part of who they were. There were very real, you know, spiritual um, connections. There were cultural connections, ceremonial connections, um, territorial land-based connections. All of that changed, you know, when the kids went to residential school, um, when people were forced onto reserves and organized sports were used, um, you know, as a way to transform, you know, the way indigenous people live their lives. And uh, so I think, you know, um, as we move forward and as we're talking about, um, you know, Canadian sport, as people are talking about Canadian sport, whether it's, uh, you know, sport policy makers, sport administrators, um, you know, physical educators, uh, you know, anybody having to do with, um, you know, physical culture, including sport, uh, there needs to be an understanding of the fundamental differences between, in, you know, the way Indigenous people engaged in, in sport and in their own physical practices and the way the newcomers came and engaged in sport in their own physical practices and, you know, in, in their own forms of sport became the dominant sport forms. And they, you know, marginalized Indigenous ways of understanding sport so that now... Um, you know, it makes it very difficult when we're having conversations about sport and people talk about, well, what did you learn through sport? And uh, there's these, um, you know, dominant uh, ways of understanding it, just like you said. Uh, well, I learned about teamwork and I, you know, I learned about uh, determination and I learned about hard work. And um, certainly, you know, that if, those are conversations that you can definitely have when we're talking about Indigenous sport. But, you know, just for a minute, like imagine how different that would look. Um, you know, if it were only in, you know, indigenous cultural contexts where people are talking about sport, you know, and its connection and, and a ties to land and what that means then for their relationships, not only to the land, but to the people around them. And, um, you know, and even now in terms of, um, you know, what it means for building up um, youth and communities that are still struggling, like under the weight of, um, you know, colonialism and institutions that don't necessarily work for them, including sport. Right. 
And I guess sort of looking forward then, how do we try to accomplish this? What steps do you think can be taken? Because sport is a very powerful thing. Mm -hmm. you, know, you look in, in this current environment right now, I think in the United States, 6 million people watched Tom Brady and Peyton Manning play golf with mm -hmm. uh, uh, Tiger Woods and Phil Mickelson last week. And, mm -hmm. you know, th there is this incredible appetite for sport. People look to sport for not only diversion, but entertainment. And, you know, sport can move the needle in, in mm -hmm. social issues. We've seen that certainly yeah. the, the Tom Longboat Awards and, and sort of as a tool towards colonialization. But what steps do you think can be taken so that sport can be used as a, a way forward on decolonization as well? Yeah, and I think for me, um, you know, as a historian and uh, um, a historian who's treading on sociology's ground, I um, I think stories are absolutely fundamental. And and I know that's heresy to um, you know some sport administrators who love the uh, their you know quote unquote statistical evidence base you know for uh, yeah, analytics yeah of course right yeah, yeah. <laughs> for how good sport is. <laughs> But at the end of the day, the analytics, you know, aren't going to help us understand, you know, people's experiences. And I truly believe that we don't understand, um, you know, indigenous experiences in sport because there aren't enough people who understand the complexity of sport and what that means to indigenous people. We need more sensitive stories told from indigenous points of view about um, what sport means to indigenous people and their culture and their identity and, um, you know, and how it could be, uh, you know, reshaped moving forward. Um, I just, I fundamentally believe in the power of stories. That's why I've spent most of my career there, even though I know I do, I do some, you know, analytics cause I definitely see value in that. But if you're going to catch like people's imagination, if you're going to catch the attention of the wider public, we need more stories, but, um, but uh, I have to admit, my heart uh, skips a beat when I think about traditional sport journalists doing this, because I just I don't think they have the capacity to tell those stories. Does that not kind of speak not only to just that sort of traditional journalist, but like sort of the state of the industry just in general? Like, you know, I, I think, you know, the Toronto Star just got bought. Uh, other organizations are laying people off. Like it's sort of the capacity. It, it almost feels like at times, you know, it's people like us. Uh, more, more so, like maybe you th than me, but you know, who who work in public history type outlets and, and can produce stuff like this, that the responsibility for telling the stories, as you say, is going beyond sport journalists and <clears throat> is you know coming into people who are maybe I, I don't know if better trained is a way to say it, but who are yeah. are, are used to telling stories as opposed to analyzing mm -hmm. the games. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that's a fair point and a really good clarification. So, um, you know, I just I, I hope it, it's um, I hope other people kind of um, see the value of telling the, you know, these stories um, and to, you know, have the, the sensitivity and the skill set to do that. And I hope it's not just me. Oh, my God. <laughs> it can't just be me. Um, but uh, but I do hope more people start to tell these kind of stories and pick them up and, you know, start asking more um, sensitive questions and giving people space, you know, to talk about um, their experiences and even, you know, helping them to explore like the boundaries of, of their experiences. Because, you know, one of the things that I've learned from um not only from my sporting experience, but also from interviewing people who, you know, are very, you know, accomplished athletes like the Tom Longboat Award winners. Um, you know, it's hard to break out of the, the sporting discourse uh, because, you know, our lives are so steeped in the sporting discourse. It's around us all the time. It's, you know, always the questions that we're getting asked. And so sometimes it's really difficult to learn, even to learn how to express ourselves, um, you know, in a different way, like to talk about the significance of sport without always resorting to um, how many, you know, uh, points you scored in a game or or, or, or shots or, or, or how fast you run, right? Like that's not necessarily the more the most meaningful thing <laughs> yeah. that came that came out of that, you know, your experience. So I think it requires both um, a sensitive interviewer. 
And also, um, you know, giving the person time to help explore, you know, the boundaries of what it is that they're trying to say. Because, again, you know, my experience has been people, I think, in their heart and, you know, to, to some extent in their head, they know what they want to say. It's just sometimes it's hard for them to say it because the the way in which they speak um, about their sporting experiences has often been so limited that um, that it's really it's all they know how to do. So um, I hope more people uh, work in this area um, and approach this subject with more sensitivity because I think there is real value at looking the history of an Indigenous sport, especially if we're going to try and figure out um, – you know, issues of, um, you know, how to um, advance Indigenous interests, uh, whether it's for health or school or, um, you know, or or sport, because it's all tied to that. Yeah, and, and I think this book is a great starting point for that, for anybody who's interested in these issues and, and delving into them in, in, in a deeper way. Uh, a lot of really great stuff coming out of it. So again, the book is Reclaiming Tom Longboat, Indigenous Self-Determination in Canadian Sport by Janice Forsyth, who mentions, uh, of course, she is a historian, even though in the Department of Sociology, which which we forgive on this show when, when people go to other departments. It's okay. We'll, okay. we'll allow it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> so thank you so much for joining me today, Janice. Really appreciate it. Okay. I appreciate that, Sean. So there you have it. My conversation with Janice Forsyth and my thanks again to her for joining me today. Again, the title of the book, Reclaiming Tom Longboat, Indigenous Self-Determination in Canadian Sport. Really engaging, really enjoyed it. Would certainly encourage everybody to check that one out. So that will do it for this week on the show. Thank you, everybody, for listening. If you have not yet, please do subscribe to the show wherever it is you get your podcast. Give us the likes, the ratings. Uh, let other people know about the show if you like what you hear. Uh, helps grow the show. Helps keep us going here as we have moved to the weekly schedule in the midst of everything going on with COVID-19. Past episodes that you might enjoy last week, we had Amanda Bittner on to talk about political leaders, the, the leaders in federal elections and, and their significance. We had uh, the episode looking at Influence, the documentary, which is still available on CBC Gem. So I'd encourage you to check that out. Uh, Cassandra Lutchuk talking about her book, uh, Enemy Alien, Ukrainian Canadian internment during the First World War. So a lot of great stuff back in the feed. If you are new to the show and you want to head back, check that stuff out. Just a, a lot of really interesting stuff over the past few weeks. So uh, I've, I've enjoyed being able to do them and, and please do go back and check them out if you have not yet. If you have ideas for what you want to hear on the show, please feel free to get in touch. History slam at gmail.com. You can find me on Twitter at Dr. Shawnee Fever. And of course, do head over to activehistory.ca. You can find all of our episodes there and some uh, really great stuff that's been coming out over the past few weeks, including a discussion on how we all collectively can better support people who are tenuously employed within the history profession. Uh, so I would encourage you to head over to Active History, check that stuff out. So that'll do it for this week. We'll be back with you again next Thursday with a new show. But until then, if you're out and you see Enrico Palazzo, please say hi for me. Thanks for listening to the History Slam podcast. Be sure to check out Active History for more features, articles, and be sure to subscribe on iTunes.